So hello, everyone. Um, so we're going to start off by asking some of the most fundamental questions that humans have always asked. Why are we here? Where do we come from? And is there a grand unified theory to explain everything in the universe? And so we, we ask that, these questions because humans are always craving to learn more. Uh, they always wonder, what's beyond this? How far can we go? You know, what are the true limits to uh, reality? And so in today's world, we actually live in a world where we can describe almost everything mathematically. You know, we have formulas, functions, equations that can describe the most bizarre things in the universe. And one of the things we're going to take a closer look at are black holes. And so to actually start uh, talking about black holes, I want to step back a little bit and try and blow your mind a little bit more. Because black holes are truly some of the things in that Mother Nature allows to happen, but they're some of the most bizarre things in the universe. Uh, and so to first start off, you know, how are black holes made? So black holes originate from uh, supernovas. And those happen uh, when you have a star that's about five times the mass of the Earth. Um, once, it's, it, once it's in the process of fusion, converting hydrogen to helium, uh, once the helium actually runs out um, during that conversion process, uh, it's going to rely on the next abundant elements like carbon, nitrogen, uh, and oxygen. Um, and once these elements start running out, um, the inward force or the outward force that's pushing the star out, the radiation force, is going to give out. And the only force present is going to be gravity, which is going to crunch the star together and then create a massive supernova explosion. And what's going to be left is just uh, those elements that the star produced, like the nitrogen, uh, carbon, and he hi hydrogen, and all those particles. Um, and then in the center of that, of that fiery embers, we're going to have a black hole. And so to actually, I, 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 I want to give credit to the person who actually made this actually possible. And that's the, it's probably somebody you all know of as Albert Einstein. Uh, he actually was the person who uh, predicted that black holes existed with his uh, uh, equations of general relativity. And um, he was actually the one who predicted that gravitational waves exist. And I'm sure some of you probably have heard of that um, because it was in social media as being discovered. And it was actually a very, very, very big thing that I think is truly phenomenal. And we'll go back to that in just a minute. Um, but Einstein should really be given more credit than what he actually got because he was actually the one who predicted that gravitational waves existed. And as well as he actually discovered that the universe was expanding uh, at a rate that was unimaginable. Um, back in his paper in 1915, uh, he was the first to discover um, that the universe was expanding at a rate that no one had ever uh, imagined. And since at the time, no one thought that the universe was expanding. They just thought it was, it was just this, you know, that's it nothing more. It can't be expanding or contracting because it's just the universe. Um, and so he put in a, ma a mathematical substitution into his equation that prevented the universe from expanding or contracting. And that actually proved to be wrong in his case. Because later on in 1929, when Edwin Hubble pointed his telescope to, the, to several galaxies in the sky, he actually saw that points in the sky, the galaxies, were actually moving away from each other at a rate faster and faster and faster. And it wasn't until 1986 when NASA actually found this rate of expansion to be 70.3 kilometers per second per megaparsec, per megaparsec. And that's a huge mouthful. And what that pretty much means is that uh, it's expanding at a rate of pretty much 3.3 million light years over that course of 70.3 uh, 70, 70 kilometers per second. And that's an imaginable rate. And so Einstein actually dis did discover that, but he wasn't given credit for it, unfortunately. And so one thing we can't give him credit for, though, is the discovery of gravitational waves. And this actually is very exciting. I think it's one of the big things that isn't really given that much attention to, but it's actually very big. Um, we can think of it as large as when um, Carl Jansky, uh, point when he pointed his radio telescope to the center of the galaxy in 1930, uh, he actually discovered that we can study objects in space by their uh, frequency they emit, and, and thus creating the birth of radio astronomy. And what Einstein, what we recently discovered, was the birth of gravitational wave astronomy. And so um, what this brings us to is actually um, the, the passion that I have for this, is because um, 
radio, uh, gravitational astronomy is a really big thing to take into consideration. It's a very complicated thing to understand, but to kind of put this into perspective, uh, I like putting things into perspective because I think, I think it really highlights how important and the highlights, uh, it really highlights how science is just phenomenal in, in its true workings. So the event that we observed, um, and these gravitational waves were actually discovered by two black holes. So hence why you know, studying black holes is really, really crucial, even though we might not even know what they truly are, uh, except that they you know, absorb everything and that not even light can escape. So um, knowing that uh, the event that actually took place, this happened about 1.3 billion light years, or billion years ago, excuse me, and that was um, when these two black holes, imagine that we have two black holes, right? and each are about the mass of 30,000 times the mass of the sun. And to actually get a better idea of what that looks like, um, you can actually fit 1,300,000 1, Earths inside one sun and multiply that by 30 and then compress that down to about a, an area of 150 kilometers and you'll get about how dense these objects were. And then speed that to half the speed of light have them uh, go in an orbit around each other, and eventually they'll, they'll converge and mix together to form an even larger black hole. And then once they mix, um, they send out a tsunami of gravitational waves throughout the universe. And LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave uh, uh, Observatory, actually were the people who picked up this signal from 1.3 billion years ago that's been traveling to us for that long and they picked, up, picked that up, and I think that's truly remarkable. Um, and so um, one of the really big things that I love is that, you know, this took place so long ago, but yet we were keen to it. We knew that it was gonna happen because Einstein's equations described it, and so we just had to keep an open eye out for it. And so one of the big passions that I have is discovering or learning about how people make discoveries and what they use them how they're, how they're coming about these conclusions. Um, and that's actually through done by programming. You know, astronomers nowadays more and more than ever are relying on supercomputers and high levels of code and um, algorithms to understand the data that comes in from the Hubble space, the Kepler, and all those other things. Um, and it's when we actually take in that data that we actually get a glimpse to learn more about what we're actually looking at. And I've, as a freshman, been given you know, a blessed opportunity to study um, uh, a black hole's accretion disk. And we actually were able, we were taking data from the Hubble Space Telescope. We were looking at the photons as they bounced off the accretion disk, which is a molten plate, uh, if you want to imagine, that's circulating, uh, circulating around a black hole before it enters the event horizon, the point of no return, pretty much. And we were observing how these the light would bounce off this disk and come back to us. and, um, and, the, and Using that, we could tell how much energy was coming from that place. You know, the angle of the black hole, you know, the size of it, you know, how much there was going on and how dense it, that area in space is. And so those are really some of the key things that I really love about science. Um, one of the last things that I always love to do is, you know, encourage other people to discover more. And what better way to do it than through programming? I wasn't much of a programmer myself. I always thought it was just a second language, but Python is a super nice tool to use regardless of whatever science you're in. Um, I strongly encourage you to definitely give it a look, look into it. You could apply it to any field you want. Now, I, when I do my physics problems, I like to write them out. And then once I have them solved, I like to plug them into Python and actually experiment and see if I put these conditions in, how will the computer interpret it and what will actually happen? And um, one of the nice things about that is that, to me, this kind of draws a bigger picture for me because it's, it's when you apply the things you know, you know, the tools you have, calculus, physics, you know, all these equations, those are the tools you have and Python just integrates them all together so wonderfully. Um, and this, to me, actually paints a bigger picture uh, of the universe, if you want to say, because when you truly understand how to solve for something, that's great, but when you actually know how to use it and interpret it and manipulate it in, awesome, in uh, you know, all these awesome different ways, you can truly learn a lot more about it. And um, my experiences, my research with black holes has been uh, phenomenal. I've learned so much 
I couldn't have asked for a better mentor um, than um, the, prof the professors here, but I do want to definitely say keep an open mind in the big picture because no matter what you do, any contributions will always be remembered for the next generations to always pick up and carry on for the, um, the quest to answer the fundamental questions that we said earlier. Why are we here? Where do we come from? And is there a grand unified theory? Thank you.